Now we would have the question and answer session. To derive more benefit for all present here today in the limited time available, we would like the following rules to be observed during the question and answer session. Questions asked should be on the topic Salah, the programming towards righteousness only. Questions not relevant to the topic would not be entertained. Kindly state your question briefly and to the point. Only one question at a time may be asked. For your second question, you would have to line up at the back of the row again and await your second chance for asking a question. Three mics have been provided in the auditorium for the audience. Two for the gents on my right and left, and one for the ladies at the back in the center aisle. Please stand in a queue at one of the mics if you wish to put forward a question and speak into the mic only when the mic is handed to you by the mic handling assistants. Written questions on slip papers would be given secondary preference. These slips are available from our volunteers on the sides. Kindly state your name and profession before putting forward your question. We will allow one question only on each of the mics in clockwise rotation. May we have the first questions from the sisters at the back. I'm Wahida Khan. I'm doing my uh, B.Ed. and I've done my M.A. My question is, why do the Muslims offer Salah in Arabic when they do not understand it? Will it not be preferable to offer Salah in a local or a regional language? The sister has posed the question that when most of the Muslims don't understand Arabic, won't it be preferable to offer Salah in the local or regional languages? Won't that be better? Sister, if for the sake of argument, if I agree with you, that let's offer Salah in the local language. So in Bombay, there will be few people who will say, let's offer in English. Few may say Urdu, few may say Hindi, some may say Gujarati. There will be an infighting. Even if we come to a common opinion and agree, that let's say in Masjid number one, Mosque one, we offer Salah in English. Mosque two, in Urdu. Mosque three, in Hindi. Mosque four, in Gujarati, and so on and so forth. Again, there will be confusion and fighting. Some may say that in Masjid number one, where you're offering Salah in English, we will follow the translation of Allama Abdullah Yusuf Ali. Some may say we will follow translation of Pikthal. Some may say Maulana Abdul Majid Daryabadi, others may say Mohsin Khan. Again, they'll be fighting. Even if we agree that, okay, let's follow one particular translation. Yet, the translation sister is a human handiwork. It cannot substitute the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the word of the Prophet. And in translation, there can be mistakes. And if there are mistakes, these mistakes will be attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, if you're offering Salah in Majid number two, where they're offering in Urdu. And suppose the Imam recites Surah Luqman, chapter 31, verse 34. And if you read the translation, most of the Urdu translations, they translate this verse of the Holy Quran as no one besides Allah has the knowledge of the sex of the child in the mother's womb. If you check the Arabic text, the Arabic word sex is not there in the Quran. It's the own interpretation of most of the Urdu translators. And if a doctor is offering Salah, he will start thinking that what kind of a prayer is this that no one besides Allah knows the sex of the child in the mother's womb. Today we know by ultrasonography, we can very well identify sex of the child. He will start doubting. So therefore, you cannot read the translation. Because if you read the translation, and if you commit any mistake, the mistake will be attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if it's the verse of the Holy Quran, or to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam if it's a hadith. And the translation cannot complete 
the full meaning. It can help you in somewhat knowing the meaning to help you to concentrate. For example, since I'm a person who keep on traveling, if I go to France, according to your logic, the Salah has to be offered in French. If the Salah has to be offered in French, but natural, even the Adhan should be in French. So if I go to France and the Muslim gives the Adhan in French, I'll be wondering who is he cursing. And if I go to the mosque and attend the Salah, it will be in French. I will wonder whether the Imam is praising Allah or telling a story in French. So if the Salah is in Arabic, irrespective whether I, as an Indian, who don't know French or German, if I go to Germany or France or Spain or any part of the world, if I offer Salah, I will at least know what I'm offering and I will know its meaning. And the Arabic Adhan is the international anthem of the Muslims throughout the world. International anthem of the Muslims throughout the world. He may belong to any part. He may belong to any part of the world. He will surely understand the meaning of that Adhan. It's an international anthem. Therefore, sister, the best advice is that we Muslims should learn the language of the Holy Quran. If we don't know Quranic Arabic, then we should at least know the meaning, the translation, in the language you understand the best of those verses you read in the Holy Quran, so that you will be able to derive the benefits of the Salah. Hope that answers the question. Next question from the brother on the right. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Rafiq Vadgaonkar, business. Many non-Muslims allege that when Islam is against idol worship, why do the Muslims worship and bow down to the Kaaba in their prayers? The brother posed the question that many non-Muslims allege that when Islam is against idol worship, why do we bow down to the Kaaba and why do we worship the Kaaba? Indicating that we are the biggest idol worshippers. We Muslims, we bow down towards the Kaaba. The Kaaba is the Qibla. It's a direction. We don't worship the Kaaba. We bow towards the Kaaba. In a Salah, we only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one else. We in Islam, we believe in unity. Suppose the Muslims want to offer Salah here. Some may say, let's face north. Some may say, let's face south. Some may say east, some may say west. Which direction do you face? So for unity, all the people in the world, all the Muslims in the world, they have been commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to face towards the Kaaba. If you are in the west, you face towards the east. If you are in the east, you face towards the west. If you are in the north, towards the south. If you are in the south, towards the north. All Muslims face in one direction for unity. And the Muslims were the first people who drew the world map. And when they drew it, they had the South Pole on top and North Pole down. And Alhamdulillah, the Kaaba, the city of Mecca was in the center. The Westerners came and they turned the map upside down. And today, we have the North Pole on top and South Pole down. But yet, Alhamdulillah, the Kaaba is yet in the center. <laughs> when we Muslims go for Hajj and men do the Tawaf, we circumambulate around the Kaaba. We circumambulate to indicate that every circle, all the circles have only one center to indicate that we worship only one true Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one else. And the best answer was given by Hadha Tumar. May Allah be pleased with him, who was the second Khalifa of Islam. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, in volume number two, chapter number 56, hadith number 675, in the book of Hajj. Hadat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, he said to the black stone of Kaaba, Sangyaswad, he said that you are only a stone. You cannot harm me nor benefit me. Had it not been that I had seen the Prophet kissing and touching you, I would not have kissed or touched you. This hadith is sufficient to prove that we Muslims, we don't worship the Kaaba. And the best answer you can give is that at the time of the Prophet, there were people who even stood on the Kaaba and gave the Adhan. 
I want to ask the question, which idol worshipper will stand on the idol he worships? <laughs>